Coming up on KUJH News, KU students react on social media after a racially charged private message gets posted online. Controversy in the U.S. Senate, how activating a rare rule on the Senate floor opened up one of the biggest debates in Trump's presidency. And a football promotion, a star player reacting to fans, and a legendary tennis player wants to get into soccer. The best from the world of sports and more on KUJH News. From the University of Kansas, you're watching KUJH News. Thank you for joining us. I'm Chloe Cowart. Social media is reacting to a group message sent by a KU student on the messaging app GroupMe that contains discriminating messages. KUJH reporter Alex McLoon is live in the newsroom with more. Chloe, a KU student's message intended only for a select group is circulating online after it was posted to Facebook yesterday. Connor Lucas wrote a message inviting others to a private party Saturday at the Cave Night Club. Lucas wrote, the party is only for the right people. He went on to write by right people, I mean not Black City, and mentioned it was only for fraternity and sorority members. It's believed Lucas was a member of Phi Gamma Delta fraternity. House President Matt Johnson says Lucas is, no long, is not affiliated with the chapter at KU. Facebook users reacted negatively to the message among the social climate at KU. Comments for the post also asked for a statement from the cave. Well, a representative from the nightclub says Lucas is not an employee and that everyone is welcome to their building. Lucas also wrote a statement on Facebook saying his message included a complete misuse of words. That page has since been deleted. Reporting live from the newsroom, Alex McLoon, KUJH News. Well, thank you, Alex. The Kansas Senate has weighed Ways and Means Committee approved a $23 million budget cut to higher education yesterday. The cuts will take an effect in the 2017 fiscal year in an effort to recover the state's overall budget hole. The cut is an effort to fix the budget shortfall in the long term. The suggestion from the committee still needs approval from the House, Senate, and Governor Sam Brownback to be enacted. The Senate will discuss the bill today at its meeting. Endowment returns fell significantly in the 2016 fiscal year. Universities and colleges reported their worst results in the depth of the fiscal financial crisis of 2009. But as KUJ's reporter Kennedy Schneiders tells us, the University of Kansas avoided the worst of the drop. According to Common Fund, college and university endowment net returns declined for the second straight year, dropping into the negative territory. The year's negative returns dragged down a 10-year average annual return from 6.3% in 2015 to 5% in 2016. Negative returns should not come as a surprise after early reports in the fall indicated the largest college and university endowments struggled in the 2016 fiscal year. The average endowment return nationwide was negative 1.9%, which is significantly below the 2.5% growth rate in 2015. The University of Kansas's returns were negative 1.2% for the 2016 fiscal year, which is slightly below its negative 0.9 prediction. KU Endowments Vice President says the negative return, while upsetting, will not harm the university. Losing money, a little bit of money, which certainly I am not a fan of doing, and even in a one-year period, but over a one-year period, even a couple of year period, is not, you know, it isn't a catastrophe for us. So we, in the fiscal year ended June 30, 2016, we're down a little bit, a little bit more than 1%. Um, never happy with losing money. Pretty much all of it explained by what was going on in the broader investment markets. Clark says even in a fiscal year where they lost just over 1%, they increased contributions to endowed funds by about 1.5%. Reporting for KUJH News, I'm Kennedy Schneiders. Thanks, Kennedy. Former Vice Provost for Diversity and Equity, Nathan Thomas III, stepped down on Monday, making Jennifer Hamer the acting Vice Provost starting February 13th. Hamer was the Associate Dean in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. A permanent replacement is expected to be filled internally by July 1st. The Office of Diversity and Equity was established in 2011 by then Vice Provost Fred Rodriguez. And the film La La Land, landed Grammy and Oscar nominees with its emphasis on jazz music. The film, based in Los Angeles, is based in Los Angeles, but it's close to home in Kansas City, where jazz music has its roots. Kansas City is considered by many to be one of the birthplaces of original jazz music. 
the jazz, music, the jazz Museum in the heart of the city pays tributes to some of the greats of the genre. Standing at the corner of 18th and Vine, locally referred to as the Jazz District, the museum features art and history exhibits and live music performances. The city takes its pride in jazz history because, according to executive producer Cheptu Cosentini Buckner, Kansas City marked an evolution in the genre. The city played a major role. There are a number of people who migrated coming down the Mississippi River to come from the south all the way to, to Kansas City. Um, you know, even migrating from Texas and other places and that kind of thing. So from here, jazz really took on a different form. Tune into the next Friday at 3 p.m. for more from Jackson Kurtz on Kansas City's jazz tradition. Now, former, Dole, former Senator Bob Dole has given a donation of $10,000 to the Research and Training Center on Independent Living at KU. The purpose of the organization is to help people with disabilities live a normal life. The Director of Independent Living says that these donations help with research and outreach of the program. There's a lot of barriers to keep them from participating in the community. And so one of the things we try to think about are what are person factors or environment factors that really tend to be barriers to fully participating in the community like everybody else. The group plans to use this donation to inform people of ways that they can improve their homes to make them more accessible to people with disabilities. One of the biggest controversies surrounding Trump since the beginning of his presidency has been his temporary ban against immigrants from seven Middle Eastern countries and North, Northern African countries. The president signed an executive order that legalized the travel ban last week. The federal appellate court from the Ninth Circuit is expected to make a ruling on the legality of the bill soon after they hear agreements on Tuesday night. They heard agreements on Tuesday night, excuse me. Trump used a passage from immigration law as his defense citing language that suggests president may suspend immigrants from any country that imposes restrictions on them in the interest of national security. President Trump's, Trump spoke on the possibility of courts striking down on his ban earlier and said he did not mince words. A bad high school student would understand this. Anybody would understand this. Suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants. In a statement earlier today, the White House defended its travel ban, calling it, quote, 100% lawful. Coming up on KUJH News, the 100th year anniversary of the U.S.'s entry into World War I is approaching. See how KU is celebrating this historical event. And even engineers need tutors sometimes. A group of KU students is here to help. Stay with us. We connected so fast when we first met. I think that our relationship will last for a lifetime. Being a role model for someone, being there for someone, there's nothing I can compare it to. She has uncles up in Minnesota that treat me like, like I'm their own now. I feel like she's like actually my big sister in a way. It's been one of the best decisions I think I've ever made. You're doing great. Let's just, we're gonna try this again, okay? Okay. Wheels, pedals, handlebar, brakes. Sit up straight, keep your weight in the center, keep your eyes on the road, hands on the grips, button the seat. If we feel ourselves falling, what do we do? Just, just keep pedaling. Good girl. Now remember, it's all about balance and steering. Steer with your hands, steer with your body. Steer into the corners and you stay out of trouble. And the bell's your buddy, so go ahead and ding that. All right, you ready? Here we go. Pedal, honey, pedal. There you go, you're a bike rider. Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But two minutes twice a day making sure they brush is easier. And it could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain. So they say it's a man's world? I don't see anybody's name on it. While they were doing their thing, we slowly changed all that. Today, women can do anything men can do. And there's one thing we're even better at. The Dole Institute of Politics is holding a four-part series about World War I. KUJH reporter Justin Ives traveled to the World War I Museum in Kansas City, Missouri to learn more about the talks. April of 2017, 
marks the 100-year anniversary of the United States entering World War I. Author and historian Michael Nyberg was the first speaker of this series. Nyberg says the following events led to the U.S. entering the war. American attitudes towards Germany got harsher and harsher and harsher. There was a German government sabotage campaign against the United States. Attempts to blow up railroad bridges, attempts to blow up shipping. There's a wonderful case. The first wiretap of a telephone in American history was the New York City Police Department trying to figure out who was putting sulfur bombs inside American shipping, European shipping coming out of American ports, I should say. Acts of terrorism by the Germans were not the only tactics used. President Wilson suspected two high-ranking German officials living in the United States of spying and immediately dealt with them. Wilson finally declared two German diplomats, Karl Boy Ed and Franz von Papen, keep those names in mind, please, declared them persona non grata and ordered them sent back to Germany. Franz von Papen later became the last German chancellor before Adolf Hitler. Germans were even suspected of rigging local and national elections before the United States' entry into the war. That echoes suspicions of the current election that was marred by hacking accusations. The second part of the series will be held at the Dole Institute of Politics on February 9th at 7 p.m. The event is free for all to attend. And it seems like there's a never-ending shortage of controversy in the White House. And Tuesday night was certainly no exception. In what seemed like a routine debate about President Trump's pick for Attorney General, the Senate floor turned into a battleground. Senator Elizabeth Warren, during her impassioned speech against the confirmation of Senator Jeff Sessions, referenced an old letter from Coretta Scott King. The widow of Martin Luther King Jr. wrote a letter in 1986 expressing her disagreement with, the, with Sessions' nomination as a federal judge. When Warren began reading, she was stopped by Senate Republicans who invoked Rule 19, a rarely used rule that forbids senators from disparaging each other on the floor. Warren took exception to the decision. I am surprised that the words of Coretta Scott King are not suitable for debate in the United States Senate. Warren will not be allowed to participate in any further floor debate over Sessions' nomination. In an effort to defund Planned Parenthood got a huge boost in 2015 when an undercover video showed Planned Parenthood officials allegedly discussing illegal fetal tissue donation. According to the creator of the video, David Doolittle, the video has its roots in Kansas. According to a report by the Kansas City Star, Doolittle was the speaker at the annual Kansans for Life Valentine Banquet, held in Overland Park on Tuesday night. Kansas Governor Sam Brownback was also in attendance. According to the Star's report, Doolittle credits Kansas City for giving him the idea to film the video. Everyone knows tutors for math or English 101 are almost as easy to find as the students who take the classes. For engineering students, however, tutors are not as commonplace. KUJH reporter Kevin Gray has more on the steps KU has taken to help engineering students. The University of Kansas offers tutors for students who need help in one of their classes, but for engineering students, tutors can be hard to find. Fortunately for them, they now have somewhere to turn. Uh, it usually helps freshmen and sophomores, but th there is a list of classes, and as long as they're in that class, we can, we, we can help out. Um, and it's just a, couple, a bunch of students from, from ACM and then me uh, d just decided we wanted to help out. ACM, or Association for Computing Machinery, is a leadership group of KU engineering students. They recognized that not enough students were getting tutor help, so ACM chair Ashley Hutton fixed the problem. The chair of ACM, and I guess all their officers, made the decision to make the program, and they just um, asked their, their group, which is a lot bigger than mine. Um, they have about 50 or 60 active members, and they, uh, I guess they have enough volunteers to come in and help out with the tutoring. Coltharp is as qualified as they come for tutoring. The university employs him 15 hours a week as one of their tutors, and he's the chair of ACM's sister organization, Institute of Electronic and Electrical Engineering, or IEEE. And I figured I'd go in and try to help them out and tutor some electrical engineering courses as well, just to get a full spectrum of all of our courses. Thanks to ACM and Jared Coltharp, engineering students can now get the tutoring help they need for the foreseeable future. 
For more information on ACM, visit their Twitter page at ACM at KU. And it's been a cold day on the Hill for students. Carson Vicroy has your five-day weather forecast. Yes, Chloe, it was very cold out there this morning and definitely a lot different than yesterday. Unfortunately, that cold has stayed with us throughout the day. It is 27 out there right now, but it feels like 16. That is because of that northwest wind at 17 miles per hour, keeping those temps a little colder than they actually feel. Now, what we saw today, we are at our high temperature for the day. We saw a morning low of 23. Now, notice that is well below average for this time of year. Uh, the airport did not pick up any precip this morning. Now, we have a lot to talk about in our five-day forecast, but we will remain cold tonight and tomorrow with record temps possible here on Saturday and closer to average temps next week at, because I am expecting a cold front to pass through our area on Sunday. Now, tonight, going to be a very cold night, probably going to be a hot chocolate and staying inside weather kind of night. I'm expecting a low of 16. Clouds will be on the decrease, and that northerly wind is going to keep us, it's going to feel much colder than it actually is. Now, some relief in the forecast tomorrow. I've called for a high of 37. That sun does return for us, and lighter winds, which will help the feels like factor. Now, a lot to talk about in this five day forecast. We're going to be cold tomorrow, 66 on Friday, so we are definitely going to see a rebound. And then look at Saturday. This is pretty impressive. 68 for our high on Saturday, well above average. And we are going to have to watch out for that record. Now, the record high temp for Saturday is 74 degrees. We're going to have to watch that very closely. Nonetheless, it is going to be a great day to move some of those indoor plants outside on Saturday. And then we do see that cold front pass through the area on Sunday, giving us those clouds. And temps will be rebounding into the 50s by the early part of next week. Chloe. Well, I'm looking forward to it getting a little bit warmer this weekend. Chloe, 70s I, on Saturday. That's insane. I cannot <laughs> wait. I drove my moped to class today without gloves and mistake. They were hurting. They <laughs> sure were. Exactly. So what do you have for sports for us this week? Well, we've had some exciting additions to the KU football team as of late. Coach Beatty has announced a new associate head coach. What led to that decision? Stay with us. When my youngest Addie was two and a half. She was diagnosed with leukemia. The doctor stopped by and said, well, it is leukemia. And then the next thing she said without even missing a beat was, and here's what we're going to do. We are so blessed and lucky to say that she is extremely healthy. I could not be more grateful to groups like the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. It was that research that let that doctor say, it's leukemia, and here's what we're going to do. It's not always easy being a dad. Do you have panda asthma too? Does that run in the family? This is the home of the most priceless kung fu artifacts. But when you make an effort... Yeah, we're not supposed to touch anything. Oh, sorry. Go along, son! It's always worth it. Whoa! Master! The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. I am gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. Welcome back for KUA, KUJH Sports. Coach Beatty took to Twitter today to announce that running backs coach Tony Hull has been promoted to associate head coach. This change could be thanks to Kansas football's 2018 recruiting class, who is currently ranked number eight in the country. Many of these four-star recruits are, in fact, running backs. Well, if you made it out to the Sunflower Showdown on Monday, let's hope that you left the kids at home. If you didn't, you may have spent the game covering their ears as K-State fans cheered their infamous, infamous blank KU chant. Many players would choose to tone this out, but KU's Frank Mason decided to embrace the crowd and even encourage them. Mason spent the game shushing the crowd and took to Twitter last night saying, this is what happens when you chant blank KU all night. The Big 12 Conference is taking action against Baylor University's Title IX lawsuit. 
The lawsuit filed last month against Baylor University alleges more than 50 acts of rape were committed by 31 Baylor football players. The Big 12 Board of Directors announced this morning that the conference will withhold 25% of any future revenue distribution payment to Baylor University. Baylor's interim president, David Garland, says that Baylor has taken unprecedented corrective actions that have led to leadership changes and more than 105 recommendations to strengthen the security of its students. Big 12 Conference Board of Directors says that this hold will remain in effect until these changes that were promised by Baylor University are actually made, carried out, and in compliance with Title IX bylaws and regulations. Well, the women's basketball team is back home in Allen Fieldhouse tonight against Oklahoma State. Last night's matchup, last time's matchup, excuse me, between these teams ended with the Jayhawks falling 74 to 70. KU's leading scorer Jessica Washington had 26 last night, last game as the Jayhawks came from behind 18 and brought it back to a one-possession game for most of the fourth quarter. A key factor tonight will be to shut down Oklahoma State sophomore guard Carly Wheeler. Wheeler is averaging 12 points per game and had 22 against the Jayhawks in Stillwater. You can catch this game on ESPN3 and Jayhawk Radio Network on 7 p.m. This week's high school showcase will feature Lawrence High School, and they will be hosting Orlatha Northwe Northwest this Friday in a doubleheader with the girls beginning at 5.40 p.m. The Lawrence High women are 11-4 on the season. Their opponents, Orlatha Northwest, are 9-3. On the men's side, the Lawrence Lions are 10-4, and, and Olathe Northwest 9-2. Well, how does, the, how does Olathe match up with Lawrence High? Coach Brandstrom has more. No, we, 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 we don't match up well with them at all. Uh, they're big and they're long, um, and, and we're not. Um, and uh, so we've got to do some things to them to get them uncomfortable, and, and uh, that'll be the tough thing, you know, to limit how many, how many – uh, second chance shots they have, make them shoot tough ones and don't let them get it back. This matchup will be aired Friday on KUJH TV. Well, well, Talia, I actually went to Olathe Northwest, so I'll be excited to watch that game online. It is very cool that you'll be able to watch it um, on TV now. It's cool that we are showing those um, here on KUJH TV. I know a lot of the alumni from Olathe Northwest are going to have to come around and watch oh, that Oh, that'll be exciting. <laughs> Well, from high school basketball to high school to high-rolling soccer, Spanish soccer giants Real Madrid caught the headlines today, but not for their play on the field. Tennis legend Rafael Nadal has been in the news because of his Cinderella run to the Australian Open final. And at his age, it's only natural to ask him what his retirement plans are. His answer? Be the president. The president of Real Madrid, that is. One of the most successful soccer teams in the history of the world. Nadal has been rated the second richest athlete in Spain and has 14 Grand Slam titles to his name, the second most ever. Well, that would be pretty exciting to go from the second richest athlete of all time to the coach of the... <laughs> exactly. I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you for watching and have a great afternoon.